bless and good day to all tuning into Christ Jesus is Lord Ministries. I want to welcome you back to another biblical study. Today is no exception from former days wherein we dig deep into the Word of God. You would have noticed that everything I teach, it can be backed by Scripture. And it is not my own interpretation that I put to the Scripture, but I allow the Scripture to interpret itself. As the prophet Isaiah says, you put line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And the Apostle Paul says, you compare spiritual things with spiritual things. If it is prophecy, we go into historical record and we show where such prophecies are fulfilled or what happened concerning such prophecies. So I'm not here to try to persuade any man to follow after me because I'm looking for numbers. And I'm looking for people to put me on a pedestal, but we are here to study the Word of God. There are many out there who are teaching heresies, they are teaching fallacies, they are teaching a gospel foreign to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the apostles. And I'm here to do my part in to teach the dust, say the Lord, so that they who seek after truth and seek after an understanding of the Word of God will receive such at my hand, so that in the time to come, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be able to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord, which was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Today, however, we'll be looking at a rather provocative. To many, it will be disturbing. To others, they will deem it controversial. To some, they would want to rant and to rave, and they would not want to hear what I'm about to say. Because today's topic is entitled Yahweh and Homosexuals. Yahweh's investigative and executive judgment vindicated in destroying Sodom. Many do not want to venture in this water. They consider it to be treacherous. They consider it to be dangerous. They consider it to be scary. Because there are many today who are embracing sodomy in the church. I was watching a YouTube video. One man had his church shut down because the members walked away from him because he said he doesn't see anything wrong with homosexuality. They asked him to recant. They said that he will not. He went on the Fox News or one of those American station news. You check it out on YouTube. He sees nothing wrong and he's preaching from the word of God. Another priestess said that the Bible is in error. Still, yet there are many today. Up to last night I was reading wherein many were commenting on an interview done by Christians and homosexuals. And they were saying that they love everybody. They don't see anything wrong with people embracing their own ideology, their own philosophy, their own way of life. And Christ said we should love everybody. But the Bible says, Two cannot walk unless they be agreed. In the book of Amos, you will find that. Two cannot walk unless they be in agreement. And what fellowship as Christ with Belial and what fellowship has light with darkness. I'm not saying that you are to stone, to kill, to shot, to chop up or to do any bodily harm or inflict any harm to anyone psychologically or physically to anyone who embrace this way of life. However, scripture is replete with inferences that such a lifestyle is wrong. Scripture is replete with inferences that if one should continue down this path, they will be destroyed. Likewise, if one should choose to be an adulterer, fornicator, a liar, a robber, a murderer, they will be damned. Likewise. 
There will be no excuse for any form of sin. It doesn't matter whether you consider it small or large. Sin is sin, and sin is a transgression of God's law. According to 1 John 3 and verse 4, it says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses the law of God, for sin is a transgression of the law. So now we find our evangelicals in problem here because up until yesterday someone sent me a response to a comment I made on a YouTube channel. They said that we do not live by law. Christ fulfilled the law. And we do not live by law anymore. So there is a movement which seeks to want to live a life according to how they please and how they see fit but I'm telling you everything is governed by laws everything is governed by physical laws everything is governed by spiritual laws everything is governed by moral laws one or the other things are governed by laws of gravity state that what goes up must come down law of motion and states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction and there are many laws laws of thermodynamics laws which are fixed laws and cannot be moved they are also natural laws so before we go any further into this controversial subject let us pray. Father, I invite your divine presence in our midst as we delve into this subject, a subject which is a taboo for many, a subject which is scary for many, a subject that many don't even want to talk about because they are scared to lose their churches, they are scared to lose their positions, they are scared to lose their influence, they are scared to lose even their YouTube channel. But Father, I invite your presence in our midst and if it's in the word it must be heard and if it's in the book we are to take a look and that is what we'll be doing at this session and this Bible presentation this study this discourse so father I pray you remove pride and prejudices from the listeners the viewers and as we delve into the study I pray that the grace of God which bringeth salvation, which has appeared to all men, teaching them to deny ungodliness and worldly loss, and that we should live soberly and righteously in this present world, will be with us and lead us into all truth. May your spirit override all endurances that the enemy will cause for anyone to study with this channel on this lesson and this subject I bless your name and I ask you'll cover us all under your blood and help us to make the necessary reform when light comes to us in Jesus name I pray Amen before we go deep into our study which will be centered around on a portion of chapter 18 of Genesis and chapter 19 according to the topic Yahweh and homosexuals Yahweh's investigative and executive judgment vindicated in destroying Sodom we must first define or have an understanding of the words used in this topic or this caption the word homo sexual comes from the word homo which means one or of the same kind and sexual which has to do with sexuality which means of a person sexually attracted to people of one's own sex so in brevity what the Oxford Dictionary is saying or the meaning is that an homosexual is one who is attracted to its own kind in terms of sexuality, gender. So a man is attracted to a man and a woman to a woman, a boy to a boy and a girl to a girl.
it goes deeper than just mere attraction. When you talk of homosexuality, you're speaking of sexuality, wherein they becomes they they become rather intimate with each other. It's not just acquaintance where they talk with each other or play with each other or go to the market or to the movie with each other, but they are in uh, an intimate relationship as a man would with a woman. Some say they are married, some are engaged, some are just having open relationships, but it is basically synonymous to sodomy, the archaic word used. They just pre it up in the 19th century to use a fancy word. Now, the next word for us to define is to investigate. To investigate means to search into, to inquire into with care and accuracy to find out by careful disquisition as to investigate the principles of moral duty. There are many who seek and want to refute an investigative judgment. And we are going to see that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is a prototype to the investigative judgment that everyone would receive, which will show us that God first investigates an individual before he or she is admitted to the book of life for eternal life or for eternal damnation in that lake of fire in the second resurrection. Now, our third word to define is executive or executive, as some would say. It is the officer. Execu executive is a noun. The, ox the officer. Whether king, president, or other chief magistrate who superintends the execution of the laws the person who administers the government, executive power or authority in government. And here we see that God is the chief executive officer overall. And he's the one who executes the laws and administers the government of this world and the universe. And he's the one who has all authority. Jesus Christ says all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. All authority. He has all authority over everything. And you find that in Matthew chapter 28 and the penultimate verse. Now, the next word for us to define is the word execute from which the word executive comes from. The word execute means to carry into complete effect, to complete, to finish. It means, secondly, to perform, to inflict as to executive judgment or vengeance. It means, thirdly, to carry into effect the law or the judgment or sentence on a person. It means to inflict capital punishment on to, or rather, to inflict capital punishment, or to put to death, it means to carry into effect as to execute laws and justice. I hope we are taking note of the definition of the words being used in the caption and in the topic. Now we look at the last word to define which is to vindicate to vindicate means to defend to justify to support or maintain as true or correct against denial censor or objection and we see that when it comes down to the story of Solomon Gomorrah 
there are many who are censoring the Christian, they are censoring God too. And they are in denial that Sodom was destroyed because of their way of life in dealing wrongfully with people in terms of sexuality. Now as we delve into the story we'll see that it's not only for homosexuality that Sodom was destroyed but that was one of the chief reasons. Abomination the scripture calls it. But I'm going to show you and the Bible defends itself. King Henry, a friend of his, the fifth, uh, told, he was told by a friend let us defend the faith. King Henry the fifth said let us defend each other. The faith will defend itself. I am here to let someone know that I do not need to defend God. God defends himself. I do not need to defend the faith or the Bible. The Bible defends itself. But what I can, I'm called to do is to preach the word, to teach the word, to explain the word so that you can have a correct and right understanding of what is being taught. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 or maybe 2 Timothy 4 verse that many will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and many will depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. No, I've seen much doctrines or many doctrines rather of devils being preached here on YouTube, many channels the sorry numbers yet when you look through what they teach and you stop to listen what they preach it is heresy it is fallacy it is a pseudo gospel from the pit of hell and cannot be bought by scripture they put your own interpretation to what they think some are looking for a great escape for example for the rapture Out of this world from biblical reality that there will be no rapture but there will be a second coming I'm yet to tackle that subject but I have so many written presentations that I need to put forth as well as others which will as the spirit leads as the spirit leads I do them now The Bible declares that the act of destruction or destroying sinners or people is a strange work or act on the part of God according to Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 21. Likewise 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4 or I should say on the other hand 2 Timothy 2 verse 4 states that God would have all men be saved. That's the reason Jesus died. Now many are aware of the judgment. They will speak of the great judgment as recorded by Daniel the prophet spoken of in Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 through to verse 14. Many cannot grasp or fathom what is happening here in Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 through to 14 much more to understand that there is an investigative judgment before a verdict or a sentence is handed down now on that point I would inform my visitors educate them enlighten them that there are three phases of any judgment. There is first the investigative phase to learn the facts of the case. Note what I just said. There are three phases of any judgment. The investigative phase to learn the facts of the case. Secondly, there is the judicial phase in which considering all the evidences or evidence a decision is made regarding the guilt or innocence of the one who 
is charged. Thirdly, there is the executive phase wherein the sentence is carried out. So for those of us who think that there can be a judgment without an investigative phase or rather if there can be an executive judgment without an investigative or judicial phase of that judgment you need to rethink and you need to go back to the word of God and study what the scripture says because John 5 39 Jesus said study the scripture you study the scripture for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they will testify of me and the Bible says when he the spirit of truth is come he will lead you into all truth and he will guide you and he will bring back to your remembrance that which Christ has taught you that which you have studied in the scripture Bible says the Spirit of God will lead you into all truth. I will not be zeroing in on the great judgment scene of Daniel chapter 7 9 to 14. Some other time I'll do a presentation on the judgment scene there, the final judgment. But rather on the fact that there will be an investigative judgment before a verdict or an execution is pronounced upon you or me for heaven or eternal destruction and the lake of fire and brimstone as recorded in Daniel chapter in Revelation rather Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10 today we are going to see from the Word of God that an investigative judgment is indeed a reality based and the Genesis story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Moreover, the Bible shows and teaches us that there is an intercessor for the just, they who have been justified by faith in Jesus the Christ. Let us go to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, and we take it from verse 16 through to verse 22 it says and the man rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom and Abram went with them to bring them on the way and the Lord said shall I hide from Abraham that which I do seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him and the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. Verse 22 and last. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abram stood yet before the Lord. Now I want us to pay keen attention on verses 20 and 21. And I don't want us to lose focus on those two verses. These two verses point to us and enlighten us that one is investigated by God before a verdict is passed or handed down against one's name, against a city, against a country, against a household, or against a town. Now, as we go into our studies, I want us to realize that the rest of chapter 18, from verse 23 onward to verse 33, is Abraham there as an intercessor, interceding for the wicked which is a representation of Christ himself 
who intercedes on the behalf of sinful man. We have an high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, an intercessor who is Jesus Christ. We read the book of Hebrews and we'll see that. Now, having just read Genesis chapter 18 verses, verse 16 through to 22, here in the narrative, the Bible tells us that God, Jesus, pre-incarnate, came down to earth with two other angels, not only to confirm the covenant that he made with Abraham concerning giving him a son, according to Genesis chapter 15, but we see in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1 that it states that God came, the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in it as, as, as he and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And it tells you that he saw the men, and he was hospitable to them. And in chapter 18 of Genesis, verse 11 through to 15, saw that we see that the covenant was confirmed again of Abraham and Sarah having their child, Isaac, who would become the heir, the father of many nations. Now, Abraham is the father of many nations. He would have the heir who is Isaac. I don't want us to misunderstand what I'm saying here. Now, let us zero in zero in on Genesis chapter 18, 20 to 22. It's in verse 20, God told Abraham that the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grievous. Now, what is what is he saying? That their sin is very great. The cry is very great and the sin is very grievous. Now, the word grievous means very severe or serious of something bad. So, the men of Sodom or the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were not only doing bad, but what they were doing, it was so severe. They have broken the bar, the Richter scale, the measuring bar to which they should go to their, to doing bad. They have superseded it. They have scaled the utmost heights of badness or wickedness or evil, so to speak. Now, the question is, why would God have to go down now, according to the scriptures? The narrative in verse 21 of Genesis 18 says that. The question that we need to ask ourselves as Bible students, is not God omniscient, meaning is all-knowing is not God omnipresent meaning that he is present everywhere is not God omnicompetent meaning he's all competent is not God all wise as the Bible says he's the only wise God is he not all powerful meaning that he has all the power because he's the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountains of living water. So why did God have to go down and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know, says the Lord. The Bible in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 verse 9 and Proverbs chapter 15 verse 3 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to shew himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, 
3 it says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good so if the eyes of the Lord are in every place if the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good question to my listening viewers study with me reason let us reason why God in verse 21 of Genesis chapter 18 says I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which is come unto me and if not I will know so you tell me God did not know before are you telling me that God is not everywhere the Bible here does the Bible contradict itself no hmm. what the Bible is telling us here is that God investigates before the sentence is handed down I will get to that does not God know all things does not he knows the end from the beginning According to one Bible commentator, God examines before he punishes. God ascertains the criminal's guilt before handing down a sentence. Uh, another Bible commentator states, God here speaks after the manner of men and for the example and instruction of judges to search into causes before they pass sentences. God is a just God. God expects just as the judicial system here operates, wherein a person is investigated before a sentence is handed down he is the one who sets the rules and every law or the judicial system is set up of the system of God the just system of God wherein justice must be served and the crime punished or the criminals punish when one commits a crime or is allegedly or has allegedly been considered to have committed the crime he or she must be investigated before a judgment is set he or she must be investigated and based upon the evidences for or against such a person a verdict or sentence is handed down pronounced upon or pronounced upon the individual no no one is ever accused of a crime and is destroyed before the judge hears his case unless it has to do with criminal gangs and you know uh, illegalities and irregularities concerning the law unless it is an autocratic or despotic rulership wherein the leader sees himself with absolute power and authority so he is the judge the jury and is the executioner and I'm not here to talk about that there are many a few countries in the world where you have despots and autocratic ruler the him the innocent the will destroy but God will be their judge there are a few upon the earth who are despotic you have communist leaders and God will be their judge I'm not here to talk about them you talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and God investigating them and then pronouncing a judgment upon them God is a gracious God a just and righteous God Psalm 89 verse 14 says righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne steadfast love and faithfulness goes before you the word steadfast means fast fixed firm 
firmly fixed or established. It means constant, firm, resolute, not fickle or wavering. Steady. It means to be steady. So God's love is not fickle. It's not some childish, um, teenage um, person who said they are in love and today they say they love and tomorrow they don't and they show emotion and they are in this emotive uh, crystal ball and then after a while it bursts and there is no more love. God love is fixed and God is love. Love is a trait. It is an attribute of God. God is just. He is always and has always been this way. It is a part of his character. He cannot be unjust. And he defines and sets the standard for justice. We all know or may have heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. And right away there are things that quickly come. That come to one's mind. Things like homosexual sodomites, fire and brimstone, destruction, wickedness, gays, lesbian, transgender, all that thing in our modern day, if we hear about Sodom, it's death, doom, that comes to mind. The truth is, and this is not my truth or your truth. It is a universal law, both spiritual, moral, natural. It is dual in nature. Galatians 6 verse 7 said, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. From the biblical narrative found in Genesis chapter 18, we can clearly see that the Sodomites, this, the, the homosexuals as they call themselves today, they sowed to the flesh and they practiced wickedness and they reaped an harvest of fire and brimstone. And so it is with sinners, they who fail to repent and turn away from sin. It doesn't matter whether it is sodomy, homosexuality, whether it is adultery, fornication, lying, robbery, murder, whatever the sin, biting, gossiping, whatever sin. You are going to be thrown in the lake of fire and brimstone according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And you will be destroyed. In the second resurrection you will be resurrected and you will be destroyed at the battle of Armageddon. You check my video, my channel, you will see Armageddon and Satan's last battle. You will understand what Armageddon is. There are many teaching fallacies and fiction and fables and I am not into that. I'm going to give you the dust, say the Lord. Jude, the penultimate book before Revelation, gives us further revelation into the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed? In Jude 7, we see that the Sodomites, they went after, as the Bible states in Jude 7, strange flesh. And I will read verse 7 of Jude in our hearing. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So, we see here that the reason as stated here, Ezekiel states otherwise than what Jude states here, and I will get to that verse, those two verses of scripture in chapter 16 of Ezekiel. It tells you that the men, that the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, cities, and the cities run about them, they gave themselves over to fornication. Notice that. And they go, they went after strange flesh. Now this is not talking about going after 
some crocodiles or buffalo or donkeys or goats and sheep no uh, lions and tigers or bears or ostriches and an and, and exotic animal species or snakes is speaking that they went after <laughs> they went after men they women went after women boys went after boys girls went after girls and secondly these men of Sodom and Gomorrah went after angels to try to gang bang them gang rape them and to initiate them into sodomy we'll get to that um, we're getting there so we see that if we give ourselves over to fornication and go after strange flesh we will receive eternal destruction we need to repent and turn there is no sin that has befallen us that God will not give us the power that when we are tempted to overcome we have an advocate who was tempted in all points as we are you know and he is without sin and with the temptation he will help us to be stronger by overcoming it um, let's turn to chapter 19 of <laughs> the book of Genesis chapter 19 verse 1 through to 29 we're going to zero in on it says and there came two, two angels to Sodom at evening and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom and Lot seeing them ro rose up to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground and he said behold now my lords turn in I pray you into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and you shall rise up early and go on your ways and they said nay but we will abide in the street all night verse 3 and he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and they did eat verse 4 but before they lay down the men of the city even the men of Sodom come past the house round both old and young and the people from every quarter verse 5 and they called unto Lot and said unto him where are the men which came in unto thee this night and bring them out unto us that we may know them and Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said I pray you brethren do not so wickedly behold now I have two daughters which have not known man let me I pray you bring them out unto you and you too to them as is good in your eyes only unto these men do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof and they said on to him they said stand back and they said again this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge now will we deal worse with thee than with them and they pressed sore upon the man even lot and came near to break the door verse 10 but the men put forth their hand and pulled lot into the house to them and shut the door let us <laughs> exegete this portion explain this portion of scripture chapter 19 verse 1 to 29 I've just read verse 1 2 to verse 10 but verse 1 to 29 tells us in depth in detail what led to the ultimate destruction the ultimate demise of the men or of Sodom and Gomorrah the fire and brimstone why it came watch closely how degrading and deceitful sin is the narrative goes on as I've read to say two angels came to Sodom 
at the evening. Now what happened is that Lot met them at the gate and invited them to his house to refresh themselves. He did not know they were angels but thought they were mere men, mere strangers, ordinary persons passing through and it was night and they needed a place to abide until they break. Notice that these men in verse 2 rejected the offer. They went down to Sodom. They knew Lot was there. They knew Lot was a righteous man. They were testing Lot. They rejected the offer to see how Lot would have behaved if he really had concern for their safety and their well-being. After pressuring them, they complied. The question is, you who consider yourself to be a follower of God, how much are you concerned for the welfare of your fellow men, your neighbors? The scribes and Pharisees, the Jews, asked Christ, who, <laughs> who is his neighbor when the lawyer tempted him with a question, what is the great commandment? Jesus said, you Israel, the Lord, your God is one Lord. You must love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is like unto the first, love thy neighbor as thyself. Now he willing to justify himself asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told him the story of the Good Samaritan, of the Samaritan. You know, so there are people who only care about their immediate circles, their family, and their close co workers and their bodies who they will play sports with, they will drink with, or they will eat with. But it is not so. If you are a Christian, you are supposed to love. Because Jesus himself said it in the Gospel of John. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have loved one for another. The angels here were testing Lot to see how much. If he really had love of God in his heart for them. Mark you did not know they were angelic beings. Because they had taken on the form of men. Just like himself. No. The men complied because he pressured them. Because Lot knew what was happening in that city. He knew that these men were no easy folks in town. These folks, they were ruthless. They were dangerous. They, they had no morality. They had no moral restraint. He knew that they were vile. He knew that they were murderers and they would kill people just as the men of Benjamin did with the Levite concubine. The Bible said in the book of Judges that these men, sons of Belial, abused the concubine all night until she died the following morning. That's how ruthless these men were. These men were. Now, let's continue. After supper, they had an incident that was contrary to natural laws or the law of nature, even spiritual laws. Uh, in chapter 19, verse 4 through to 5, he said, The men of the city, old, young, and in between, came for the two angels who now were in the form of men. They had come to gang rape, to gang bang, to sodomize, to abuse, to humiliate these two visitors to the uh, to their city and Lot's house, his guest. Now it is questionable to ask how is it that these men knew that Lot had these two men inside? It is obvious that someone must have seen the two men enter the city and they must have watched and saw where they went and in whose house they went. So they 
it must have been reported that they had their watchdogs they had their spies they had their men who were uh, checking to see who came into Sodom and who went out and so they were taking careful note and they took it to their leaders of the sodomite party and they decided that okay we are gonna give him the welcome of sodom by sodomizing them and teaching them what we are and who we are you see the laws of sodom and gomorrah protected these sodomites just as today wherein the laws of the land protect the sodomites and the homosexual the lesbian the gay the transgender the queers and the in between those ranks now you as a heterosexual have less rights than these men and women these inhabitants of sodom are a liking for strange flesh an unnatural liking for the things contrary to nature let us turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 1 Romans chapter 1 and we'll read from verse 21 through to 28 the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 verse 21 verse 21 reads because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened here now when they became vain it, they, their imagination the things they imagined was meaningless it was meaningless it was they were not right imaginations they were vain the Bible says in the book of Psalms I believe it's chapter 2 for why do these enrage and the people imagine vain things no that was exactly what the men of Sodom did they were imagining vain things and they did not glorify God for who he was they tried to obliterate the image of God from them by allowing evil spirit the sodomite spirit to take them over and we need to know that because man is created in the image and likeness of God Satan had, has an enmity towards man and he wants to destroy man and we see the story of Sodom and Gomorrah where he led them to go contrary to spiritual laws, moral laws and natural laws and the result is that the edge was removed from around them so they, became, they received the judgment of God after they were investigated now if we zero in on chapter 19 of Genesis 1 Genesis chapter 19 verse 1 2 to 10 we'll see that the judicial evidences were collected there we could see that in any judgment as I have stated at the inception of this Bible presentation that there are three phases of an investigative judgment the investigative phase to learn the facts of the case the judicial phase in which considering all the evidence a decision is made regarding the guilt or innocent of the one who is charged so we see from verse 1 through to 10 the investigative and the judicial phase of the judgment of Solomon Gomorrah wherein these men went down according to 
verses 20 and 21 of Genesis 18 Jesus says I will go down and then it tells in verse 22 that the men set their face towards Sodom and they went there so the men being the representative of God were as God himself going down there in person because they were the ambassadors for God they were the investigators for God investigators whom God could trust investigators who will not tamper with the evidence that they gathered and the evidence that they gathered were sure the cry of what came up to God and the abomination which the men of Sodom were doing because they came they said we want to know the men bring the men out unto us that we may know them the Hebrew word yada is not a word it means you get to know about a person or to acquaint yourself with a person you, you get information about the person but it has to do with sexual relation intimacy having sexual intercourse with the individual so they were they said to lot bring the men out so that we will have intercourse with them in other words seeing that the genesis account tell us that god created woman eve for man and man said she's born of my bone first she should be called woman and god said be fruitful and multiply and Jesus relating to the Sadducees said in the beginning it was not so God said the two shall become one they are no longer two but they are one so now these men were going contrary to the law of God according to the Genesis law wherein a man should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so these men now were a bunch of marauders lawless marauders because first john 3 verse 4 says he who commits sin transgress the law for sin is a transgression of god's law so it doesn't matter what form it comes in every sin can be listed under one or the other of the ten commandments which makes up the law the moral law which makes up the law of the Decalogue it's one law but there are ten commandments and every sin everything can be listed or be numbered under one or the other of the ten commandments it's ten words so these men said they wanted to have sex or relation with the men so you can just imagine what would have happened to these men if these men were these two angels were just men like lot flesh and blood who came from some place like two of abram's servants or two other men from the surrounding uh, nations of the canaanites ah you can imagine what they would have died just like the concubine uh the concubine of the Levite in the book of Judges where the Bible said the Levite gave the men the concubine and they had sex with the concubine all night they not only had sexual relation as a man would with a woman but they also abused her by sodomizing her and she died all men there it said the men of the city of Benjamin there and just picture what would have happened to these two men uh, of all men the Bible says the men of the city both old and young so they came all all it was a city of Sodomites it was, they, they were dangerous they were ruthless they were merciless they were 
perverts. They were rude fellows and they were rustic in their lifestyle. They were crude. Now, Romans chapter 1 verse 21 through the 28 says because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts foolish heart was darkened so why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain thing when you imagine vain things meaningless things how does that glorify God and because you imagine vain things your heart is going to be darkened because if you are not meditating upon God and the things of God you cannot become enlightened the Bible in Philippians 2 verse 5 says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus and the Apostle Paul says set your affection on things above not on things beneath th or things of the earth you know so verse 22 of Romans chapter 1 professing themselves to be wise they became fools the Bible said a fool has said in his heart there is no God so what it is saying of the men of Sodom and Gomorrah they consider themselves wise they may have had the doctor of philosophy they may have been physicists astronomers great politicians agriculturists economists teachers some might have even been advocating their religion they were a part of secret societies because we know from one Sodom is involved these guys have no restraint and they will go to any length to receive power so they were involved with the demonic so they all came to initiate these men, two angels, into their practice. To the point, these men said, there is no God. So they did as they pleased, whatever they saw right in their own eyes, they did. The Bible says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, unto birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So these men of Sodom were dishonoring their own bodies between themselves, abusing each other because God did not create a man to be with a man or a woman to be with a woman but he created a man to be with a woman and for them to procreate to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth that was what God told Adam and the law still goes on it is a fixed law that cannot be changed or reversed by any the Bible says they changed the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. So they treated God as if he was just a mere mortal man or some fowl of the air or some beast that they acquainted themselves to and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through their lust, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So let it be. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their loss one towards another men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meat and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient it is not convenient for a man to be with a man or a woman to be with a woman 
it's not convenient to man to be with animals or animals to be with man but it's convenient for a man to be with a woman and to be husband and wife to procreate and to replenish the earth that is the law in Genesis and that's God's law let's analyze Romans 1 21 to 28 the Bible tells us that these people who practice sodomy that they were reprobates and they are reprobates evil men the Bible tells us they were taken over by devils and evil spirits the Bible tells us here in that they were involved in witchcraft witchcraft occult is associated with sodomy they are like Siamese twins they were a part of the many secret societies and organization of Sodom and Gomorrah these men of Sodom now let's look at Romans chapter 1 verse 21 to 28 analytically now. based on the narrative of verse 21 through to 28 it tells us that the men were liars the Bible tells us that they changed the truth of God into a lie the Bible tells us that they were idolaters in verse 25. The Bible tells us they had no regard for God, verse 21. The Bible tells us that they are fools. And the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's verse 22. They made the image of God into animals and birds and creeping things that's verse 23 their passions were bestial animalistic verse 23 God abandoned them because of such evils verse 24 their affections were vile they were evil and wicked the Bible tells us they changed they switch rules of genders verse 26 and verse 27 men with men women with women boys with boys and girls with girls Bible tells us they were lustful towards one another the Bible also tells us that they were same sex they consider love to be love and they did not understand what love is God, he who love it not know it not God. So if you do not know God, you cannot love. They were pushing their agenda to the point that whoever visited their city, not Sodom, was given a course, a practicum 101, same sex, sex edu in sex education. In verse 28 of chapter 1 of Romans, it says, we learn, rather, that such did not retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to their reprobate mind. Reprobate here means evil. So, tells their mind became darkened, according to Romans. Here, Paul. So, the Spirit of God no longer was with them. God withdrew His presence from among them. There was no edge around them, no protective wall, Therefore, the serpent could come in and bite them up. And that is exactly what happened. The Bible in Proverbs says, He who break it on edge, um, a serpent will come in and bite him up. When it speaks of an edge, it speaks of protection. And God's law is what protects us and his presence. Because Satan in Job chapter 1 told God that because he had put an edge about Job, then he could not do anything to Job. I believe it's verse 10. It says, Has not thou made an edge about him, and about his house, and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hand, and his substance is increased, increased in the land. So we see an edge is for protection. So Satan was telling God that no evil can befall Job because he, God, has put an edge round about him. And the edge was placed around Job because Job was a perfect and upright man according to the narrative of Job in the beginning. They tell her that he was perfect and upright and one that feared God and skewed evil. So when you fear God, 
and eschew or skew evil, then an edge will be placed around you. But if you go contrary to God's law, you are breaking the edge which should protect you and the serpent is going to bite you according to Solomon in Proverbs. Satan injected his poisonous venom in their minds. They became living dead. No integrity, no love for fellow men, no honesty. And they became as brute beasts. They became savages and every man who visited their city was initiated into sodomy. Except for these two because they were angels and they had superpower. Their slogan, their motto was love is love. So they showed love by forcing. They showed love by gang rape. They showed love by abusing others. They showed love by home invasion as we saw that they were going to break into Lot's house and do lot a worse thing than they had planned to do to the angels. They were so depraved. They were such reprobates. They have transformed into that they had into they have been transformed into such evil being that they had no desire for women. Even young virgins who were offered to them, they refused and rejected according to uh, verse 8 of Genesis chapter 19. It tells us that Lot said, Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do you to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. In other words, that's telling them if the men had wanted to be involved in sodomy, they would have stayed out in the street, and then there they would have had them to do what they wanted to do. But the men came for safety and protection and it was his responsibility to protect them. And he was seeking that which is best to protect the men. Now, the men became violent. They became cross and possessed by such wicked spirits of homosexuality that they threatened Lot to do a worse thing to deal worse with him than they would do to the angels. When devils possess an entire city of men, that's a dangerous city for you to go. When devils possess a city of man, that's a dangerous place to live. When devils possess a city of man, that is a very dangerous place to pass by, to drive by, or to even visit and stop by. It is in a very dangerous place to go to do business. We see that there is a return of the sodomite spirit to this world. That same spirit that ruled the minds and lives of the city of Sodom. All our cities of today's world are filled with the sodomite spirits. Let us turn our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 40, 16 verse 49 to 50. Verse 49 says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Let us analyze verse 49. Scripture, let us analyze verse 49, this portion of scripture, and make a list of the iniquities mentioned. We see in verse 49, it tells us that Sodomites and the, uh, and the people of Gomorrah, pride, fullness of bread, idleness, no regard for the poor and needy. The number one sin, law first mention, pride of Sodom, which led to their base immorality and unrestrained bestial animal passion was pride. <laughs> In Proverbs 16 and verse 8 he said, Pride comes before destruction and a heart is spirit before a fall. We see it is the very same thing that caused Lucifer to fall. Ezekiel chapter 28 and 
Ezekiel chapter 28 and also Isaiah chapter 14 and if we read those portion of scripture Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 14 to 19 we'll see that that's what Lucifer is charged with and that is what the prophet help us to understand and Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 2 to 20 tells us that it's pride that caused Lucifer to fall from heaven we see that the fullness of bread they were filled they lacked nothing they were never hungry and if we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8, 10, 2 to 18, you read it in your own spirit time. God tells his people that when they are coming to the land and they are eaten and satisfied, then they should not lift up their heart against him and said, it is by their own power that they have achieved that which they have achieved. But we see with Sodom and Gomorrah, they did not retain God in their hearts and they thought that it was by their own power, by their own might, by their own wisdom and their skill that they achieved what they achieved. Historians will tell you, or history will tell you that Sodom and Gomorrah was on a lush, fertile plain and they flourished, everything flourished there. Trade, agriculture, everything. And they were so rich and affluent that they lack nothing and when they lacked it now in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 8 says God said on the Lord that God would give the power to make wealth they thought that the wealth that they gained was because of their own doings and God was warning his people in Deuteronomy warning us today as Christians that whatever you acquire whatever I bless you with do not take it to yourself to think that is because of your skills your education your degrees but it is I who blesses you and order your steps and allow you to get what you get I'm not talking about those of you dealing in the dark arts and witchcraft to acquire stuff we know it's Satan who gave you that now we see the next abomination the next sin is idleness in Proverbs 24 33 it tells us about idleness and what it will do and you could read that uh, rejection of the poor is the next the Bible said the people had no regard for the poor unless fortunate in Psalms 41 and verse 1 it says who, who gives unto the poor who has pity on the poor lend unto the Lord and we see that the men and history will tell us that these people had no pity for the poor they were wicked they abused the poor they didn't take that which the poor had and there are many today are similar are traveling in a similar card a car like these men of Sodom and Gomorrah they are no regard for the less fortunate but Psalm 41 and verse 1 shows us that for those of us who have pity on the poor God considered it to be a loan unto him and he will repay another portion of scripture which deals with having regard for the poor Leviticus 19 15 chapter 25 verse 35 to 36 we have Deuteronomy chapter 15 7 to 8 and verse 10 to 11 we have Psalm 82 verse 3 through to 4 we have Psalm 140 verse 12 we have Proverbs 14 verse 21 and 31 we have Proverbs 17 verse 5 we have Proverbs 19 verse 17 which tells us lending to the Lord when we show kindness to the poor uh, we have Proverbs chapter 21 verse 13 Proverbs chapter 22 22 to 23 and we have 29 verse 7 which says the righteous cares about the poor so if you are of God and you are righteous you will care about the poor we have Isaiah 58 verse 6 through to 10 we have Matthew 25 verse 40 Luke 14 12 verse 12 through to 14 and we have James chapter 2 and verse 2 to 4 we have also 1st John 3 verse 17 through to 18 now we're going to look at verse 50 of Ezekiel chapter 16. The prophet Ezekiel helps us to understand that 
the sodomites were haughty, they were puffed up. This spirit of pride led them to practice and commit abomination before God, not just mortal man. The conclusion is, therefore I took them away as I saw good. The execution is, I took them away as I saw good. So it is God who sees what is good. It is God who sets the standard for righteousness. It is God who judges. It is God who examines before he punishes and ascertains the criminal's guilt before handing down a sentence. So, it is not man who decides what God should do or what God should not do. No, you see judgment executed. I took them away as I saw good. And what, 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 let, let's go to um, Deuteronomy chapter 19. I, I love this, what, what we are unearthing here and understanding concerning the judgment. Um, I stopped at verse 10. It says, uh, but I'll continue. But the men put forth their hand and pulled out in to the house to them and shut the door. Now, we saw that from verse 1 of chapter 19 to the verse 10, there was the investigative phase and the judicial phase. Lot was first to be investigated. When Lot said to the men, come and abide with me, the man said, no, we'll stay in the street. And they pre Lot pressured them. So they saw that Lot, okay, Lot wasn't one of these evil men down here. At least there's one. Went into the house. Now, after that, they had supper. They refreshed them before they laid down to sleep. The men came banging down on the door and said they want to have sex with the two men. Lot should bring them out. Now, Lot told them, no, Lot said, I give you my two daughters. They said, no, we don't want your two virgin daughters. Said, we will have the two men. But watch what they said to Lot. They said, we do a worse thing to you. We're going to deal with you after we deal with these men. We're going to deal with these men, but we're going to deal worse with you. So in other words, we're going to kill you. You're going to die when we are through with you. Because you came to sojourn with us. And now you want to be judge over us to tell us what to do. Who are, you? Who are you? You're not from here. You came here. We were born here. You are a sojourner. You moved here. You don't belong here. So we're going to discipline you and we're going to show you who is who? That is what they were saying to Lot. And so, here we see the judicial phase of the judgment upon Sodom. That the men there, the investigators, the two angels, they saw all that was happening. That these men came to do to them, want to sodomize, to gang rape them, and also home invasion. Because verse 9 tells us that the man said, stand back. They were telling Lot, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn. He will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee. So they were threatening Lot to sodomize him and to kill him. And they pressed so upon the man, even that, and came near to break down the door. So he knew him invasion. So these men were into invading people's place. If you won't open and came out by choice and to adhere to their request, they're going to break down your door and get you and do unto you what they deem right in their eyes. So, we see all that was gathered against them. No, their probation was closed. Their probation was closed there. Their probation was closed there. And so he said the angel put for them and pull that in, shut the door. 
and he struck them with blindness. Let's read on. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, As though any hear any beside, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the city of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Let us look back. We, I told you before, three phases of any judgment. And I've dealt with the investigative phase, wherein in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 18, you could read that. And you could also read verse 1 through to verse 10 of chapter 19, wherein you will see also the judicial and the investigative phase of the judgment being played out against Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, as we come to verse 13, wherein the third phase of any judgment is the executive phase where the sentence is carried out. The judicial phase is where the, the evidence or evidences are considered and a decision is made regarding the guilt or innocent of the one who is charged. So, here we see verse 13 now, based on what the men did, are uh, from verse 4 through to verse 9, that the executive phase kicked in, where the sentence is no carried out. It was about to carry out. It has already been carried out. Because it has happened in the spirit. Because these men knew. But they went to ascertain the facts. The charges that came up against them. Because Satan accuses us day and night before God. And I believe just as he presented himself to God. When the sons of God... And God said, consider my servant. He must have presented himself before God. And said, Sodom and Gomorrah. They break your law. They are going contrary to your law. Therefore they belong to me. And so, they were ripe for destruction. So God had to go down. God had to investigate them. Because Satan lay claims to Sodom and Gomorrah. Saying that the men... The city of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities belong to him because they have no regard for God's law. And so he has rights to them and they are his. And that's what happened. Verse 13, for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy. Executive phase of the judgment. They are destroyed. And... Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said up, Get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angel hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And we go to verse 24. You can read verse 16 through to verse 29. But I'll take it up now from verse 24. It says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities, and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the city, and that which grew up upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain. And beheld, a lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, 
when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. So you may be dwelling in a city that's polluted, a city that God is going to overthrow, a city God is going to destroy. And if you are righteous, God will bring you out like Lot. But I'm going to say don't linger if God is telling you to leave where you are from. You are dealing in homosexuality and God is telling you to leave and stop practicing it. Do not linger like Lot because if Lot had not lingered, his wife would have lived. Lot lingered, the Bible said, and as a result, his wife met her eternal destruction. He says, and while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand, verse 16 of chapter 19, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So, we can be an endurance to someone's salvation by lingering, by not making the necessary steps and doing what we are to do when we are called upon by God to do it. Someone's salvation hangs in the balance. And such one can be destroyed if we do not act on time and accordingly. As I have said, we see judgment executed in verse 24 of chapter 19. God rained fire and brimstone. They were taken away as Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 50 says. They were annihilated by God. Though Lot was disgusted by what was going on in Sodom, he could not have destroyed them. This is evidence in, the, in he waiting at the city's gate for for the night or during the night he, 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 he was fed up and he was looking to see if he could rescue any soul anyone who came in Sodom and take them to his house because he knew what the men of Sodom would have done to them or the women he knew there was no justice in Sodom for foreigners or strangers that city was under the control of Satan and his evil spirits they had sold out to the devil. Now there are those who will defend the Sodomites while condemning God. In Leviticus chapter 18, we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22. And I'll read it in your hearing. It says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. No, you can't fight with me about that. If you're homosexual, you're a sodomite. That's Bible. And the word of God is my rule of faith. I'm not here to condemn you, to say anyone should kill you, stone you, chop you up or shot you down. But I'm letting you know that the Bible condemns such practice. Just as it condemns adultery, fornication, lying, theft, murder, gossiping, backbiting, lust, God condemns your way of life and you need to turn and repent and be saved in God's kingdom God loves you that's why he sent his son to die for you in John chapter 3 verse 16 he said for God so loved the world and the homosexuals are a part of the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life I'm telling you it doesn't matter how deep you are in sodomy. It doesn't matter how deep you are in any form of sin. If you repent, if you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, if you ask him to come into your heart and to give you power to overcome, his Holy Spirit will come and will transform your hearts and lead you unto Christ, who is everlasting life. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, as I am coming down to a close, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. 
First Corinthians, it says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So we see that here, the Bible speaks out against fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, that's transgender, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So, Sodomites abuse themselves, lesbians abuse themselves, gays abuse themselves, transgender abuse themselves, queers abuse themselves, all sexuals abuse themselves, and Bible says you must not be deceived, no man let you go astray, don't go astray and believe, it says you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and we'll read verse 10. It says, For warmongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So Paul is saying, you being a warmonger, if you are a sodomite, you are a warmonger. If you are an adulterer, you are a warmonger. If you are a fornicator, you are a warmonger. And perjurer, men stealers, whatever you are. You cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And such lifestyle is contrary to sound doctrine. You cannot say you are a Christian and indulge in such lifestyle. Let us look at Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18 and Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12. Both says the same thing. Said there is a way which seem right unto a man and the end thereof are the ways of death. I'm telling you your way might seem right. But I'm telling you it will end in death. Not just physical death because it's a pure intent unto every man wants to die. But I'm talking about the second resurrection. Second death, Revelation chapter 20 verse 10, lake of fire, where eternal separation from the source of life, who is God, Jesus Christ. Now, according to one biblical scholar, <laughs> and I must say I pity many of them, theologian, biblical scholars, because they are heretical, many of them, they are not Christians, and they feel that because they can read and write and have some letters behind their names, that they are in a position to tell one what to think or how to interpret the Bible. The Bible is its own interpreter. And the Holy Spirit leads and guides into all truth. They are not the Holy Spirit. Now according to one biblical scholar by the name Kelly Murphy, who um, is at the Central Michigan University, he says, and I quote, we have to remember that Paul and the world Paul lived in did not understand gender the same way that we do today. And also that Paul is using that example to lead up his argument against worshipping idols. Well, that's your opinion. You're telling me the most learned man that all agnostics, skeptics, atheists, it doesn't matter what rank has put him at the height, the summit, and he even, I've read that he's the most learned man that has ever walked this earth. He, Moses, and Jesus, all three are in a class by themselves, cannot be equated, will never be rivaled in this life. They are the most learned men, Paul, Moses, and Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who set foot on this earth. Are you going to tell me that Paul, who was taught two and a half years in the desert of Arabia by Jesus Christ after his conversion, he was struck down on the Damascus Road. He did not understand gender the same way we do today. How I understand gender is that a man is a man. God created male and female. How do you understand gender? Is a female something else? Well, many of you are skewed and screwed in your thought processes that today you can be a man tomorrow you are a woman the next day you are, you, you are a transgender the next day 
you are a binary the next day you are asexual the next day you are all kind of sexual except what God had created you to be now that's madness and the Bible says because you retain not God in your heart he gave you over to a reprobate mind and not only that your foolish heart is darkened the Bible says in Psalm 2 verse 1 why do these enrage and the people imagine vain things in Proverbs chapter 19 verse 29 a it says judgments are prepared for scorners scorners those are you who snuff your mind scoff at God's words scoff at God's laws and principles and precepts now if you do that you're gonna go contrary to them and what you're gonna do you're gonna receive judgment just as Sodom and Gomorrah received judgment in time to come lake of fire and brimstone eternal separation from God now Isaiah chapter 26 also tells us about the judgment you can read that in your own spare time and see what the judgment will be like let us turn our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 6 and verse we we'll read verse 23 that's Proverbs chapter 6 verse 23 it reads For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. What did it say? The commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. Have you heard what I just read? Read it for yourself. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Now, a lamp gives light. The law is light. The commandment is what makes up the law of God. Everything that God gives is a command and everything that God gives can be found summed up in the law of God. It's life. Correction of instruction. Are the way of life. So the commandment, the law is there to reprove us to correct us if we go astray to show us the right way to walk in the Bible as I've said in Proverbs chapter 12 verse 18 there's a way which seems right each one of us have our own proclivity to walk contrary to the law of God our own proclivity to walk in the way that our own heart our foolish heart desires to walk but God's law is there as an edge of protection to lead us in the way everlasting and in the path of righteousness let us look at Psalm chapter 19 verse 7 through 14 and this will be our final portion of scripture Psalm chapter 19 verse 7 through to 14 he said the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul <laughs> the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple why do I laugh why do I snicker because of the evangelicals out there who are preaching and teaching that you do not live by law and Christ abolished the law Christ fulfilled the law but they use words out of context they do not understand what it means to fulfill if something is perfect and converts the soul what does it convert the soul from it must be from sin because man have sinned all have sinned and come short of the glory of God the wages of sin is dead but the gift of God is eternal life Romans 6 23 or Romans 3 23 check those two verses of scriptures um, it said the statutes of the Lord are right rejoicing the heart the commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes no what is telling us that 
the teachings of God. They are right. Whatever you find in the Bible is right. And you can accept it. You don't have to accept what I say. But accept the teaching that thus say the Lord. Take the Bible for yourself. Study it. Read it. Pray and meditate upon it. As God says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Day and night teach it to your kids. Write it upon your doorposts. And speak it to them in the morning when they wake up. And when they go into bed. Now. The commandment is of the Lord. Is pure. Enlightening their eyes. To enlighten the eyes means that it makes you see clearer. So, the commandments of God are there to open your spiritual eyesight for you to see things the way that they are to be seen. Because things happen in the spirit realm first before it's manifest in the physical. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous are together. So if something, as I've said in verse 8, is pure, why do you want to get rid of it? Now, if something is clean, why would you want to get rid of it and abolish it? And if it endures forever, how can you get rid of it? The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous are together. No, so you need to go and check up the meaning of the word judgment as used in reference to God's teachings and his precepts and laws. And if they are true and righteous altogether, why do you want to get rid of them? Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. More by them is thy servant, what? Warned. What are you warned of? And in keeping them, there is great reward. You are warned of the evil that is there. The snares that the enemy sets for you to fall. And to entrap you. And to steal your soul salvation. And your crown of life. Now, the Bible says by keeping them, there is great reward. So, why would God abolish it? So that you don't get any reward? No, that's foolishness. Bible doesn't teach that you are misunderstanding the Bible. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret fire, and that is my prayer, O oh God, Yahweh, hello him. Cleanse thou me from secret faults, I pray. Amen. Verse 13, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Yeah, I'm praying now. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. I close by reminding us that there are three phases of any judgment. The investigative phase, to learn the facts of the case. The judicial phase, in which considering all the evidence, a decision is made regarding the guilt or innocence of the one who is charged. And thirdly, the executive phase, where the sentence is carried out. I have presented the case before you of Sodom and Gomorrah, wherein we see all three phases of the judgment um, carried out in Sodom's demise, Sodom's destruction. I Hope and trust that you have been blessed. I hope and trust that you have learned something. And I hope that you share this video with someone. And you would have gotten a better understanding of what the investigative judgment is. And the judicial phase of the judgment and the executive phase of the judgment. I did not tackle this subject just by dealing with the investigative Because I can do a study on the investigative judgment and the executive judgment but I want to show you that God is just and he will judge us fairly and he investigates our case first before it is decided for our admittance to heaven or for us to be thrown in the lake of fire which will be hell and that day may God bless you may God keep you thank you for tuning in thank you for supporting Christ Jesus is Lord ministries and I pray and I hope and I ask of you to share these Bible studies with those who are seeking after truth 
and want to understand the Bible. I bless you all in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, I pray for all those who have tuned in, all those who have listened and supported this Bible study. And I pray, O oh God, that your word will go forth and it will accomplish its purpose that it will send forth according to Isaiah 6, 55 verse 11. Lord, you said in Jeremiah 1 verse 12 that you watch over your word to perform it. You said in your word, Lord, that not one tittle, not one jot of the child pass away but heaven and earth will pass away before that happens to your word. I bless your name. I glorify your name. Let your will be done. Continue to bless this channel. Every obstacle that stands in its path, I send fire and brimstone from the throne of God upon it. And the power you have given me to trample upon serpents and scorpions, according to the Gospel of Luke, I do that. In Jesus' name, I break down every wall I break down every altar demonic that is risen up against this channel and I pray O oh God for all those who study with me may you continue to bless them and may they grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and be in favor not only with you O oh God but with man is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good and godly day. God bless you. Please hit the like button, subscribe, share and please leave a comment. God bless you, and I bless you. Amen.